Now let's go to some other definitions. A definitive host is a host wherein the parasite lives off its adult and sexual maturity stages. It is also called your final host in some of the references that you might encounter. The intermediate host is a host wherein the parasite lives off its larval and asexual stages. And the intermediate host is usually commonly seen in your flatworms or trematodes or your flukes. But also in some of your other flatworms, um, your cestodes or your tapeworms. Now please take note that intermediate hosts may be present in some parasites. Not all parasites would have intermediate hosts. However, all parasites, for them to be considered parasites in the first place, need to have a definitive host. This is their eventual target host. Again, all parasites have a definitive host. Some parasites may have intermediate hosts. Some parasites actually have one intermediate host, while some other parasites may have more than one intermediate hosts. Paratenic host is a host wherein no further development occurs but harbors the infective stage of the parasite. Basically, they are just a carrier organism that a parasite latches onto before they get transmitted into another definitive host. Reservoir hosts, on the other hand, are hosts wherein the parasite continues any of its stages and acts as additional sources of human infection. The most common reservoir hosts for human parasites are actually pigs and rats. Here in the Philippines and in agricultural countries, the carabao is a very important reservoir host for a very important human parasite called your schistosoma. Vectors are organisms responsible for transmitting parasitic infection from one host to another. Vectors are divided into mechanical vectors versus biological vectors. Mechanical vectors are parasite vectors where no development or changes in the life cycle stage occurs during transit, meaning there is no change in the life cycle of the parasite when it is being ferried by the vector. A biological vector, on the other hand, is an organism which transmits the parasite inside of it but while the transit is ongoing, the parasite undergoes further development. Say from an egg to a larva, or from a larva to another stage of larval development. Now there is another term called a fomite. Please look up the definition of a fomite and try to differentiate what a fomite is versus a mechanical vector or a biological vector. So again, know the life cycle of each parasite. Now, in knowing the life cycle of each parasite, you have to understand what are the components of the life cycle of parasites, which you will mainly see in the CDC illustrations. You have your infective stage versus your diagnostic stage. The infective stage is the stage in the life cycle that enables the parasite to infect man, meaning the stage of the parasite which actually enables the parasite to infect man since we are dealing with human parasites. For example, in the case of Ascaris, the, I guess the, one of the more well-known paras human parasites, the embryonated egg is the infective stage. The other stages of the parasite cannot infect humans. For example, the larval stage of an Ascaris cannot infect humans and also even adult, the big spaghetti-like adults are not able to infect man. So that is worth noting. The diagnostic stage is defined as the stage in the life cycle that is usually identified to confirm the presence of a parasitic infection. So in terms of medical diagnosis, you have to understand what the diagnostic stage is. As an example, again, for Ascaris, you get to diagnose an Ascaris not just by seeing an Ascaris inside, but if you get a stool sample and you see Ascaris ova or egg in that stool sample, you'd be able to diagnose an Ascaris infection occurring inside a human being. Now, there are several common infective stages that you should take note of. As a quick summary, the most common infective stage of worms are, of course, the 
egg or the ova. Some eggs are unembryonated, but eventually, under the right circumstances, depending on which parasite they are, they would eventually become embryonated. And as we mentioned earlier, it is mostly embryonated egg or ova that is the infective stage of helminths or worms. Now, some helminths or worms can infect humans with their larva. There are different forms of larva depending on which parasite you're talking about. But for simplicity's purposes, let's talk about the two major forms of larva that are usually attributed to parasites. You have your rhabditiform larva and the filariform larva. Rhabditiform larva is the feeding form of the larva, while the filariform larva is usually the aggressive form of larva. So in most cases, the filariform larva is actually the infective stage of helminths which infect humans through their larva. Again, it is also worth noting that some helminths would infect humans with only their ova or egg. Some helminths would infect humans using only their filariform larva. However, it is also worth noting that a few parasitic genera would be able to infect humans with their ova and with their larva. So please take note of those as well. Flukes, on the other hand, infect humans with other types of larvae. And you have your special larvae names, including your Cercaria and your Metacercaria. So please take note of these two special fluke larva names. So when you encounter flukes or trematodes, please make sure that you identify if their infective larva is the Cercaria stage or the Metacercaria stage. Now please understand that the Cercaria will eventually become a Metacercaria as the fluke undergoes development. But again, some parasites would have the Cercaria as its infective stage while some parasites would have the Metacercaria as their infective stage. Protozoans, on the other hand, do not have ova or eggs and larva. Again, protozoans are totally different from your worms or helminths. Protozoans do not have eggs or ova. They also do not have larva, whether rhabditiform, filariform, cercaria, or metacercaria. Protozoans, rather, would have either cysts or trophozoites, or both, as their infective stage. In the life cycle, it is also best to understand the mode of entry and the mode of exit of the parasites. The mode of entry literally means the route in which the parasite enters the human body. In the case of Ascaris, it is usually through the oral route, and the mode of exit is the route in which a parasite exits the human body. Again, in the case of Ascaris, Ascaris exits the human body through the fecal route through your stools. And that is why we can say that the mode of entry and exit of the Ascaris parasite is through a fecal oral route. There are other common modes of entry, and we mentioned earlier ingestion of the parasite through the more commonly termed fecal oral route, as we mentioned earlier, and also by non fecal contamination. Non fecal contamination would include, say, ingesting hamburger which contains a specific parasite. So that's a non fecal contamination. So, non fecal contamination actually refers mainly to foodborne infections. Skin penetration refers to, well, parasites penetrating the human skin in order to gain access into the insides. Now, this can be a direct skin penetration wherein the parasite actually burrows into your skin and eventually reaches your circulatory system to eventually go throughout its life cycle. And that is called your direct skin penetration. This is commonly seen in hookworms. These are the worms 
which burrow through your skin of your feet when you go walking about barefoot and they eventually get to infect you. Vector-borne skin penetration, of course, refers to parasitic infection through a third party. The most important example of vector-borne skin penetration of a parasite would be the transmission of malaria infection through mosquito bites, very similar to dengue infections. The other common modes of entry of parasites would be through the respiratory route, and this is when you inhale accidentally or intentionally inhale the infective stage of some parasites. There might also be direct penetration of the respiratory mucosa, primarily your nasal and oral mucosa um, by a few parasites. Quite limited mode of, modes of entry would include blood transfusion or through organ transplantation wherein people get to be infected because they receive blood or organ transplantation uh, which are infected by some parasites. Congenital transmission is also possible but only through some parasites. And auto-infection is, is a special classification of routes of entry wherein the person already infected by a parasite gets to be infected by the offspring of the same parasite within his or her body without the offspring actually having to undergo developmental changes outside of the human person. So that means a person is infected and it produces offsprings inside the body and those offsprings get to mature inside the body without leaving the body and they get to develop into mature parasites which eventually parasitizes the same host. Not all parasites can do auto-infection. As you will learn throughout the course, most parasites actually need to expel their ova or their larva or some other portions of their bodies outside of the human host in order for their life cycle to complete. 